just told you lies You are priceless in his eyes You are treasured You are beautiful In the eyes, in the eyes Of the one who made you How you doing this morning, church? Good to see everybody. If you love Jesus, give him a hand clap right now. Hey. We've got so much happening upcoming. Check that out and make sure you're a part of that. It's just going to be awesome. Uh, last week, 12 people baptized into Christ. I mean, incredible weekend. Praise God for souls getting saved in this place. It was awesome. Hey, uh, we're, we start today with this woman series. And somebody said, why are you doing a woman series? Well, because this past spring, I did a man series, and people came up and said, men and women, you're going to do a women series? You know, tell them women, tell those guys, you know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> I did the man series. So here it is. So if you got your scriptures, go ahead and turn there to Psalm 45, to Psalm chapter 45, and uh, we're going to get there eventually. We're going to get there eventually, so hang on to that, but we're going to talk today specifically about how difficult it is for women for you to feel valuable. And since it's a, women's, a woman series, I wanted to start off with a man illustration. <laughs> I got this uh, question just a while back. I answered it. I know many of you have heard this story before. But growing up, I had a, I had a moment in my life. I did not grow up in church, and, and I went through my teen years. It was very rough years. Didn't know what I was doing. And at age 20, I realized something's missing in my life. I didn't know what that was, but I had wrapped my life up in like my best friends and my girlfriend, and it's like all of a sudden my best friend started working nights, I worked days. I broke up with my girlfriend that I've been dating for like for nine months, and all of a sudden I, I questioned, there's got to be more to this, this life than what I'm living. And I hit the lowest point in my life ever, age 20. I remember lying in bed, reaching up to God, praying, God, if you're really up there, show me what to do with my life. And from that point on, I realized Jesus. I met Jesus. My life completely changed. And I tell you that story because I had wrapped my entire identity up in something that led nowhere until I found Jesus. And I know there are some women here today that you have wrapped your lives up into areas that's leaving you hopeless and helpless to where you feel less than valuable. And so I want to tell you that today because I want to talk to you about, ladies, why it is that you don't feel valuable and what it is that you can do to overcome that. And let me tell you, it's not found in the things of this world. It's not found in the externals. It's found deep inside, deep inside here. So I want to start today by just talking about six things. Six things that women tend to just wrap their lives up in that leave them sometimes feeling hopeless. And the first is this, their appearance. Their appearance. I mean, women want to look good, right? Just want to look good. That's why women do so many things in order to, to look good with their appearance. That's why you go shopping, ladies, and you come home and tell your husbands, I saved 50 bucks. Yeah, I spent 400, but I saved 50 bucks. I never got that equation. But you do those things because that next thing that I buy is going to make me what? Going to make me, make me feel good about myself. And hair color? I mean, how many hair colors do we have? Now, don't feel bad. I know I've seen several of you with different hair colors and everything. But it's, when my hair is this color, I'm going to feel, feel good about myself. When my hair gets to this length, I'm going to feel good about myself. That's why the cosmetic industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. Because why? Women wrap their identity up in their appearance. Secondly, their home. Their home. Women wrap themselves up in their home. In my first ministry, I uh, went to one of my leader's homes one day, unannounced, walked, uh, went to his house, knocked on the door. His wife wasn't home. He invited me in. <laughs> I learned early on. The, the guy, the leader said to me, he said, you know what, I ain't going to do that again because his wife had come home and she's like, you know, you don't invite anybody into the house when it's not clean especially the preacher, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I learned right then that, you know what, homes mean a lot. So think about this, and I want to just talk to the men for a second right here, and, and uh, I think you need to get this. Women want to know that things are in order, because 
If things are order in order in their home, things are going to be in order in their mind. Everything is going to be, everything affects everything. And you know what? If things aren't in order in her mind, guys, things aren't going to go well with you into the night, if, if you know what I'm saying. So uh, I know there's 14-year-olds in here, but but, when, but but listen, when your wife walks into the house and, and the dishes are not done and the, the dishwasher is full, the floor's dirty, fold, clothes are not folded up, you, you know what she's thinking? Something's not right. Things are messed up in this house. And so she, she understands this. Things are messed up. Men, this is what foreplay is. Foreplay is when you fold the clothes, when you do the dishes, and when you clean. The, I'm not preaching right now, right? Clean the house, guys, right? Go, there's guys going home today. I'm going to clean the house. Go home and make that bed. That's right, if it makes her happy. Everything affects everything because women wrap their identity up in their home. The kids, kids. Women wrap their identity up in their kids. Child fails a, fails a, a spelling test. I'm a horrible mom. I'm a horrible. My, my child couldn't spell potato on the test. He grew up to try to be president and still couldn't spell potato on the test. I was talking with my wife, Denise. I know you've got to be older to get that job. I was talking with Denise. Uh, uh, they spent a couple more weeks uh, back home when we went, try, went on break, summer break this summer. And, uh, and, and they were doing sparkler stuff uh, that my sister got the kids. And, and, uh, and they were laying the spark, hot sparklers down, and for whatever reason, my four-year-old up goes and grabs a used sparkler that just got put down on the ground and burned his hand pretty bad. And my wife's like, I'm a terrible mother. I'm like, no, you're not. She said, if I just hadn't gotten that thing of water that I was going to get, you know, he wouldn't have burned himself. I said, no, honey, a terrible mother is you getting that hot sparkler and handed it to him and going, here you go. <laughs> That's a terrible mother. <laughs> Accidents happen. But, but there, there are some women in here, and you want to you wanna be such a good parent, such a good mom. And sometimes you go overboard, especially mothers with daughters, because you try to live your life through your daughter. You do. Got an example? Yeah. Women who put their two-year-olds in beauty pageants, and they make them up to look like an adult. There's something amiss with that right there. But what are you trying to do? You're trying to get your worth and your value living your life through your child. Because your identity becomes wrapped up. You want to be validated as a mother. Relationships. Relationships. Maybe you define your life by the relationships that you have. And I know there are some single girls in here. And I tell you what, you picked the best Sunday to be here today in this entire series. Until next week, <laughs> if you're single. But here it is. You guys wrap yourself up. If a guy is pursuing you, single ladies, and he's calling you, he's texting you, he's, he's going after you, it's like, you know, I feel good. But the moment that he breaks up with you, what happens? Your life disintegrates because your identity is wrapped up in this guy pursuing you. There are some women in this room, and, and you wrap your identity up in your marriage. And if the marriage isn't going well, guess what? You're not going well either. You don't feel beautiful. And there are some married women I know that think if I were just my husband's golf club, at least I'd be held, right? Yeah. There are women in this room that are married that don't feel beautiful because your husband doesn't value you as a beautiful woman. And, and you think, if, 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 he could, if he could just change, if I could just change, but nothing's ever going to change because it's that thing on the inside that's so hard to change in our thinking. Career. Career is another area. And men, let me just say this. Uh, this is true with your wife. This is true with, with your life. She goes to work, has a bad day, comes home. It's not going to be good at home then either. Because, there, ladies, listen. When you go to work, and you, if you wrap yourself up in your career, things aren't going to be perfect at work. They, they never will be perfect at work. And, and, I mean, you're an imperfect person. You work with imperfect people. You're never going to have a perfect day. And I know everything is connected to everything. You're not going to have a good day when you come home because you're imperfect. And I know some women are like, if everybody at work were just like me, we'd have a great day. No, it's not. Even if they were just like you, it wouldn't work right. But your identity is wrapped up in your career. Religion. Religion. One of the worst things that some women can do is to get involved in a Bible study group. You're a preacher. What are you talking about? I've been in church world too long to understand 
that, that the biggest gossips come out of sometimes that, that group that people are in, and oh no, we're having a Bible study. Oh, we're having a Bible study. I've seen this. I've seen women who are trying to be godly. I've seen godly women who like try to go into this group, this group of Christian ladies at the church, and they get in there, and they try to fit in. They, they want to fit into the group. Instead of being like Christ, they try to fit in to this group, and they start pursuing things that God never intended for them to pursue. And things never get corrected in that situation, because she'll never be good enough. She'll never be good enough, and she feels less than valuable. So I want to do something. I want to put those things up on the screen right there. I want you to look at those things, lady. Look at each of them, and I want to describe for you in one word how you feel this morning. Probably every woman in here, you can't do that. Women are too complex. Yeah, I can. Look at all those areas that we pursue. There are women in here who feel very, very tired. Right? Are there some women in here who feel tired? Because you are going after all the... You're thinking, if I could get these things just lined up, if I could get those in order, if I could get those in shape, everything's going to be great. But that day when you get those things in order is never going to happen. And if you wrap your identity up in those things right there, you're never going to feel valuable because you're always going to feel so worn out. So this morning, what I want to do is I want you to ask yourself three questions to kind of evaluate where you are spiritually. Just to evaluate where you are right now and investigate where we are in our hearts and our minds today. So the first question I want you to ask yourself is this. Who do I listen to? Who is it, ladies, who is it that you listen to? And guys, uh, you can do this too. Who is it that you listen to? And we need to get that down because I tell you what, we live in a culture, we live in a world that pressures us into its thinking into its habit, it tried to force us into its mold, and it's trying to push you into areas, frankly, where God never intended for us to be. Take, for example, magazine covers. I mean, what do all the magazines say? Well, if you got that body, you'd feel good. If you had that house, you'd feel awesome. If you could cook like Martha Stewart or do time like Martha Stewart, I'd feel awesome, right? You, you, you just would. And this is the first thing that I want you to see out of Psalm 45, ladies. Psalm 45 Verse 10, the scriptures say this, Listen, O daughter, consider and give ear. Forget your people and your father's house. Just forget the culture. The first thing God is saying here is listen. Listen, why? Because you are my daughter. In fact, you can circle that word listen if you do that in your Bibles. Listen to me, why? Because you are my child. You need to hear from me. And for some of you, that's awesome for God to say, listen to me because I'm your father, because you had a good father. It was awesome for you growing up. But for others, when you hear that God is your father, that just might make you repulsed because of how you grew up with your father. Maybe you grew up with a father that was totally detached, totally abandoned you, and you think, I could never follow a God that's going to abandon me. Maybe you grew up with a father who abused you and you're like, I cannot follow a God because you think God the Father is just coming down on you to abuse you. And man, that's, that's why those of us who are parents, who are dads of, of, of daughters, it's imperative for us to be the best godly father that we can be so when our daughters grow up, they can have a healthy image of who God the Father is and receive him into their life. But for some of you, you grew up into a home where you never were good enough. And you brought home the B, and your dad said, you know, you, you got to get an A next time. You bring home the A. It's got to be an A+, plus, honey. You bring home the A+, plus, you got to keep it there. And you lived your life always trying to do better because your dad demanded it, and, he's all, and you never could live up. And you think, God the Father's that same way. Why would I follow after a God in heaven who I'm never going to meet his expectations? Let me tell you something about the God of the universe. The God who wrote, listen to me, O daughter. God the Father is everything that, wish, that you wish your earthly father was and so much more. God the Father is true. He's trustworthy. He is honest and he is able to give you all that you ever asked or imagined. The scripture says this morning, God is saying, ladies, 
I love you for who you are. Not for what I'm demanding of you. I love you for who you are right now. So ladies, who are you listening to? Because it's so easy to compare ourselves to other things, right? Like I mentioned Martha Stewart. Some people are like, oh, I just wish I were Oprah. She's so wonderful. But is Oprah married? Does Oprah have kids? Does Oprah not, not have an entourage to meet her every need? But she, she does, she's not perfect, right? Ladies, guess what? You take away your kids and, and your husband, you could probably be a pretty godly woman right there just walking right along, right? But we don't have that. But God is saying, listen, oh daughter, I want you to listen to me because you're my daughter. And one of the reasons I think that we, some women just get themselves, themselves so tripped up and, and, and cannot view God as their father it, and you as the child, is because you evaluate what's going on in your life. And you see the struggles that you face, and you go, you know what? It's just what I deserve. I, I'm just getting my just desserts. I did this and that. And, and, and you begin to settle in life for things less than what God has in store for you. And women settle all the time. Not, com- not comprehending that God, the God of the universe, the God who created everything, is your father and wants to give you good things, so why settle? We were feeding our seven-month-old Camden the other day, and, and you know if you've got a child and he's eating in a high chair and he's that young that there's more food around the bottom of the chair than it really gets in his mouth, so we pull him out of that chair, stuff all over him, put him down on the floor to clean up, and, and what do I look down and see my child doing? He's eating crumbs off the floor, right? I mean, why is it? I mean, he went to our dog the other day, ran, crawled over to the dog, grabs a handful, and just stuffs everything into his mouth. I know, it's sick. But a child eating crumbs when, when he could have anything, a feast, if he, if he just wanted it, because that's what parents do. Ladies, if you're single, let me ask you this question. Why are you settling for a crumb, that guy that you're dating, who is a crumb, why are you dating this guy? And some of you are. I know your crumb's not here this morning, but God is saying, listen to me, O daughter, this guy fell from the table a long time ago. He is a crumb. Others of you are like, I'm married to a crumb. You got to come next week because we're going to talk about that. So make sure you catch next week. It's, and it's not just the men, you know, that you're going after. It's a crumb. But we're settling for crumbs in life because we don't recognize that I am the father of the king. And some people are settling for crumbs, and God is just saying, would you just receive the blessings that I want to give you in your life and quit wrapping your identity up in these things that are so aloof, these things that are far-reaching. Wrap your identity up in Jesus Christ. So who are you listening to? Who is it? Who is it that you're going to let define who you are as a woman? Are you going to let Jesus and God's Spirit define you or the world, the culture in which we live? That's question number one. Question number two, what does God think about me? What does God think about me? Some of you are like, I don't want to know because you know what you've done. I mean, you've been so worn out by life. And and don't we all have just misunderstandings that we just don't really comprehend the situation that we're in. I mean, have you ever had a misunderstanding with your spouse? I I know a guy, I heard this story once, that he wrote on a piece of paper, I hate my marriage. And he was doing research. He had written this note, he forgot about the note, went to work the next day, came home, knew something was wrong. You ever do that when you walk home, guys? You open the door? Hey, how you doing today, babe? Fine. Hey, what, you good day? Yeah. You, You know that look? You know that attitude? This lady had found that note. And finally, they have this discussion. She says, you hate me. And he's like, no, what are you talking about? I found this note. I hate my marriage. You hate me. You want a divorce. And and, and they got things worked out. But I tell you what, it was messed up because of just a simple misunderstanding. And, And there are ladies in this room. And you have a misunderstanding about God. And you're thinking, I I don't want to hear 
how God feels about me because I know because of the circumstances in my life that he must hate me. And you don't want to hear. You don't want to hear the truth. One of the hardest things is hearing the truth and comprehending the truth and then feeling out those emotions. But look at this next verse. The first part of verse 11 from our text says this, the king is enthralled by your beauty. If you don't get anything else out of the message today, I just want you to get this. The king is enthralled with your beauty. And that word uh, enthralled means to be held captive by, to be spellbound by. Some, some, some of you are like, the king doesn't know me because if he did, he wouldn't like me. No, he, he sees you, he knows you, he created you before the very foundations of this earth, and he knows who you are. And the king, the king, memorize that, the king is enthralled by your beauty. So what you've been searching for, ladies, all of your life is discovered in Jesus Christ because the king, the king is enthralled with your beauty. Have you ever been held captive or spellbound by something that you've seen? I remember on a, on a study tour to the Middle East, we, we, we climbed up Mount Sinai in the middle of the night to sit at the peak where Moses received traditionally the Ten Commandments, and we watched the sunrise just come up, one of the most spectacular sunrises I'd ever seen. Held captive by that. I remember getting married and seeing my wife going, that's my wife, staring at my wife. She's going to marry me? <laughs> And my kids, kids, watching those little guys, my, 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 little, my little Camden, just like literally pop out with that attitude. It's like I'm just looking at this infant, just wanting to hold him. And it's not because he's beautiful. He's like slimy, right? He's like, oh. And we get him into the room. We're cleaning him up. We're dressing him. There's people like outside the nursery looking in. It's like I'm not looking at these guys because I'm looking at this baby, beholding this little baby, held captive by this little baby. If I am an imperfect father, looking at a child so slimy, if I'm imperfect, just wanting to love that little boy, just think, ladies, about your Father in heaven who loves you, who created you, who wants to hold you and embrace you. He is spellbound by you. He is enthralled by your beauty. Have you ever considered the fact that the woman is the first creature that God didn't make from the dirt? Guys, you're not that special. And he created us from the dirt, right? It's like God's making a mud pie and, oh, there's Adam. Just like that. He made the, the beast of the field. But then he wanted to create the woman. And he said, you know what? Dirt's not going to get it. So he makes her out of something special. And he took a rib, Genesis says, and fashioned her so beautifully that Adam just burst out in song when he saw her. So beautiful. He created you ladies. So special. And that's what he wants you to hear. And I know some of you are like pushing by, oh, I'm not beautiful. I'm not, I'm not beautiful compared to the standards of this world. It's just not true. Listen to what Psalm 139 says. Psalm 139 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because why? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You're beautiful. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from me when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. The Bible says, ladies, God custom designed you. And the king, the God of this universe, is enthralled by your beauty. And I know this is, where, this is where people push back. But Greg, you know, I'm divorced. In the church for years, church says I'm damaged goods because I'm divorced. But you know what scripture says? The king is enthralled with your beauty. Greg, I'm a single mom. I got kids. No, no guy's going to ever think that I'm beautiful because who wants to have that? Well, you know what? The king is enthralled with your beauty. I've got, I've got such a dark sexual past. I know I've disappointed God. You know what God says? The king is enthralled with your beauty. Everything that, that you ever did, he knew you and created you anyway. And the king is, guess what today? He is enthralled with your beauty. And if you're in Christ, you're beautiful. 
because God sees Jesus living in you. And if you're not in Christ right now, the king is enthralled with your beauty because he sees the potential that is within you when you live your life for Jesus because the potential is so amazing and he sees that in you. And that, that holds God captive. It ho holds him spellbound because he knows what is within you that he wants to release out of you. And I know some people can't see that. I know some people push back. That could never be me because of the light, all of that stuff that you grew up with, that you've done in your past. Some people don't even want to see it. It's kind of like when you were in high school or college, and there was this guy, ladies, that you liked, and you lo you're like, you know what, he's, he's, he's cute, and you know he thinks you're cute too, and, and it's like you walk up on a group of guys, and you've got your friends, and you're talking, and, and, and nobody's looking at each other, but when you're looking away, he's like checking you out. And when you look up at him, he looks down. And when you look away, he looks at you. And then you, you walk away and your friends go, man, this guy was just like checking you out. And you're like, no, he wasn't, because you don't see it. And they're like, no, yes, he's checking you out. Listen, that is the God of the universe. The king is enthralled with your beauty. And that's what the Heavenly Father wants you to know today. That's maybe why you were here on this day, was to hear that the king is enthralled with your beauty. Question number three. Who will I live for? Who will I live for? Ladies, I want you, if you're filling out that outline, hold your pen. We got one more blank. Right now, what I want you to do is I want you to focus on that, that lady, maybe that person that you admire the most. I, I want you just right now to get that thought in their mind about who it is that you admire most. Anybody got that thought? And guys, you can think about this too. Nobody. Nobody's thinking. Nobody, nobody admired anybody this morning. We're doing bad. I know. Think about, think about that. Who it is. And there's a line in your bulletin on the bottom below that third blank right there. It's blank. I want you to write down the quality of that person that you're thinking about. That quality, that you, maybe it's patient, something like that. I want you just to write that down. Physically write that down because you can look at that later. Now having written that down, what I want you to do is, is I want you to think about that quality and I want you to go back to the top of that list if you, where you filled out those six things, if you fill that out. I'm guessing that 100% of you who wrote a blank there didn't say anything about one of those six things that we listed earlier. Nobody wrote, I admire her because of her shoes. I admire her because of the purses that she always wears or her hair. You wrote something like her attitude, her kindness, her ability to forgive. So ladies, I want, I want to ask you this question. Why is it that we work so hard for the things that we really don't admire and the things that we really do admire, we just kind of let those go and neglect those things, those things that we admire most in other people? Why don't we work toward those things that we admire the most in other people's lives? Why don't we go after those things that we know mean so much to us? Because we get pulled by the things of this world. We get pulled by the things of this culture. So who will you live for? Who will you live for? People see who you are. Would, would, would somebody be able to look at your life and say, you know what, I'd really admire this quality in her? And, and you can answer yes if you answer this question rightly. Who will you live for? Verse 11 goes on to say this. The king is enthralled by your beauty. Honor him, for he is your Lord. Circle, honor him, for he is your Lord. He is your God. He is your Father. And he has created you with such incredible potential. Who will you live for? You will honor God, your Father, when you live for God, the Father. The one who already believes that you're beautiful. The one 
who already sees the value in you. The one who wants to lift you up. So stop wearing yourself out. Going after all the things that the world tries to press into you. Because you're never going to feel valuable. Unless you go after the things of God. So honor God. Follow God. See, the message of the church has been so wrong for so many years. You get your life perfect. You get your life straight. And you'll be acceptable in God's sight. But the message of God today in your life is that the king is enthralled with your beauty. So live for him. You honor him. And ladies, when you make that decision to completely sell out, it's going to make a biggest difference in your life. Huge difference. Verse 12 goes on and say, The daughter of Tyre will come with the gift. Men of wealth will seek your favor. All glorious is the princess within her chamber. The princess within her chamber. The princess is glorious in her chamber. She lives for God behind closed doors. Her captive thoughts are held captive by Jesus in her chambers because she is honoring God by her thought life. Even behind closed doors. So ladies, you've got to decide, who am I going to live for today? Who is it that I'm going to live for? Are you living for the culture? Are you living for the world? Or are you going to be the daughter of the king? Are you going to live for him? Honor him. For he is your God. The king is enthralled with your beauty. Would you pray with me right now? Just where you're seated. Just every head bow. Every eye closed. Ladies, I just, with your heads bowed, eye closed, one of the most difficult things I think for you to hear is a message about your value and your worth being a child of the Almighty. And I just want to ask you, ladies, honestly, do you have a hard time seeing yourself as beautiful and valuable? If you have a difficult time seeing yourself that way, I want you just to cry out with me right now in this prayer. God, let me see you as you see me, O oh God. Dear Father, let me see you as you see me because you see the beauty in me. And, and I know that the world sees me in a way. I know He sees me in a way. I know they see me in a way. But Father, I want to see me as you see me and to remove the doubt and the pain and just simply being too tired sometimes to take the next step because ladies the king is enthralled with your beauty and maybe you're here this morning maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ the things that the, the thing that will make a woman complete completely beautiful is having Jesus come into your life in making you complete. And maybe for the first time in your life, you've realized, I need you, Jesus, more than ever because I've heard your message that God loves you and He wants nothing but the best for you. And if that's you, I'd, I'd like for you just to pray with me today, Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner in need of your forgiveness. I believe that you died on the cross, that you rose from the grave. And Lord, I ask you to come in to my life and make me complete today, to be my Lord, to be my God, to be my King, and to live for you. Father, I thank you so much for allowing us to worship here today, to, to look into your word. Father, you are an awesome God. And you don't see us as who we are, but you, you see us as who you've made us to be. And I pray that every woman in this room that, that might have a hard time seeing themselves as you see them, that they would never forget that you are enthralled with their beauty. And I pray for the woman who's having a tough time with her past right now and struggling with that, that they, just the current situation that they're in and they don't feel beautiful, that they, they get it, that you are enthralled with their beauty. I pray for, for the, 
the lady who's dating that guy she doesn't need to date, that you would give her the courage for that next step. I pray for the wife that feels like she's in the hopeless situation that she's in and she just wishes her husband would affirm her beauty. I pray that she wouldn't seek to change him, but, but she would change the way that she sees herself through the lens of Scripture to understand that the king is enthralled with her beauty. Father, I thank you. I thank you for making everything beautiful in your time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If, if you are somebody who decided to receive Jesus um, and you have a grab a connect card from the chair in front of you and, and write down your name and your number contact information and put that in the offering as it's coming by in a moment in a little bit we're going to after we receive an offering we're going to stand and we're going to sing and if you would like prayer for your next steps prayer for anything going on in your life our prayer team is going to be out in the lobby during the time that we sing, just make your way out. They'll be facing you when you walk out. Just go up to them and say, hey, I want you to pray with me or for me about whatever that need might be. Right now, I want to ask uh, Gary Shear if you'd come over, Gary. Gary's from the Solomon Foundation. He's going to tell you about the Solomon Foundation. He's going to tell you that we wouldn't be in this building if it wasn't for the assistance of the Solomon Foundation. But he's going to tell you how the Solomon Foundation can help you in other ways right now. So Gary, we're going to receive the offering when Gary starts talking a little bit. Gary, glad you're here, man. Thank you. I'm glad I'm here. Speak away. Yep. Can you stand here? Well, yes, I would like you to stand there because we want something positive to look at in comparison. So, uh, many, uh, many times when you are presented with a ministry, the first thing that comes to mind is I better grab my wallet because there's an ask for a donation or a contribution to make that ministry possible. The Solomon Foundation is uh, quite different in that respect and we are able to make loans to churches, we help people with investments and savings, but we have an operating budget and our first core value is to honor God and therefore to honor Him to demonstrate our confidence in Him. We take a tithe out of our operating budget and give back to the churches. And so this morning I present to Oasis a check for $5,000. How's that? There's another way that we are able to help. We're often thought of... I want to go to the bank before... The, okay, I want to go to the bank. Is that okay? <laughs> uh, whatever you want to okay. do, right. my man. I just want to see you endorse it and stick it through the window. <laughs> he has got such a sense of humor that I love. Here's what we do at the Solomon Foundation. Number one core value is to honor God. Number two is to help people know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Number three is to offer the best interest rate possible to our investors. We do that at 2.25 all the way up to 4.75. On savings, on IRAs, Roth, traditional, whatever, old 401ks that you might have that are sitting off somewhere and you're not sure what to do with them, you can roll them over to us. We will pay uh, 4.45 all the way up to 4.75. We then help churches take the next step. There are many of you that are here that your first experience at Oasis was in this building. We were able to help this building come become a reality. Number five is to have fun. And what fun it is to know that as you help a church, you help them to be more effective in reaching lost people, reaching one more person for Jesus and one more and one more. The impact of the Solomon Foundation has been huge on my family. My mother put all of her stuff with Solomon. The reason was her son is working for Solomon. But that wasn't all of it. Every time I would come back as she was living with us, she'd ask, 
tell me about the churches. And I would go to and tell her about baptisms that I saw, like on the screen. And tell her that her money and our money was having an impact on somebody's eternity. Because it made it possible for the church to grow. I had to move her in January to a, a dementia unit. Only because she had her money at Solomon was she able to provide for her own care. Solomon Foundation can be a great blessing. And I don't care whether you've got $250 or $250,000. Those dollars invested with Solomon will have an impact on somebody's eternity. We are four, over four years old. Our assets total over $210 million. But the most impressive number is not the interest rate or the total assets. But we are counting over thousands of baptisms and new people coming to Jesus Christ because of the ministry of Solomon. I've got the information in the lobby. Uh, love to talk to you. Thank you.